Before I introduce you to our uh, very special guest this morning, would you please welcome to the podium the, uh, the Dean of the Ulster University Business School uh, to say a few words of welcome. Would you welcome please Professor Marty McHugh.
that is committed to shaping the futures. Shaping the futures of our students, shaping the future of business, and shaping the future of our community. With a very strong regional presence, the school is a major contributor to the development of our economy. As a member of Harvard Business School's affiliate network, and with strong links to Babson College of Boston, the school has established itself as a major centre for management and business education of international standing. Our work with Professor Fergal McCormick and his team at PKF FPM is an illustration of how we at the Ulster University Business School work with business and for business. Fergal is a member of the 40 strong team of influential and highly talented visiting professors who work with the school. Our visiting professors play a unique and vital role in helping the school to contribute positively <coughs> to building a better, stronger Northern Ireland, a stronger economy, and a knowledge and skills base that makes this region one of the most attractive places for people and organisations to live, work, locate and invest. Many of our visiting professors have helped us to develop our portfolio of courses. Many have hosted placement students and have provided internship opportunities which help our students to acquire and develop a host of essential management and leadership skills which make them highly attractive candidates to prospective employers. And many others have been active participants in our research and knowledge transfer activities. Our visiting professors are important ambassadors for the business school and for the university. They help to communicate what it is we do and the value that we can add to business. In a very real sense, through our teaching and learning, research and knowledge transfer activities, we seek to foster the growth of business, management and leadership skills in our students. Skills that are often cited as being critically important in supporting the rebalancing and rebuilding of the Northern Ireland economy. In this context, through the work of the Ulster University Business School with Professor McCormick and his team, it is very fitting that we have an opportunity this morning to hear the views of someone who has demonstrated time and time again expert <coughs> management, leadership skill and business acumen. Jim, you are very welcome to Ulster <coughs> University and the Business School for this fourth PKF FPM <coughs> annual leadership talk. We look forward to hearing your conversation with Jerry Kelly, who is, of course, one of our best known and highly accomplished broadcasters. I have no doubt that, is, as is customary on these occasions, we are in for a very lively, entertaining, and stimulating discussion. I hope very much that you will all enjoy the event and your time with us at the University here this morning, and that we will have the opportunity to welcome you back in the not too distant future. And for those social media fans amongst us, if you wish to tweet during the event, use hash talk, sorry, hash, hash um, leadership talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I used to go to Paris every month 
uh, and I would fly on a Sunday night and uh, arrive in Paris Charles de Gaulle at uh, 6.30 in the morning and get into the office for meetings at 8 o'clock and it became very tiring. So I started cheating and I fly home now on a Friday night to Dublin. I drive up to Carringford where I have a little hideaway and I get over as often as I can to Australia to see some of my brothers uh, who are here with me today and, and sisters. So as often as I can, I'm involved a lot with Cooperation Ireland which I believe in passionately because we have as you know, all know, a, a good, fragile peace, but we have to work much harder at reconciliation, which is which is not easy. We'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Uh, but first of all, before we go any further, there's one question I want to ask, and it's mainly for clarification purposes, yes, and yes. maybe for, uh, for education for some of us, uh, because, you know, when we're polite service, we want to say things properly. Is it moat and Shandon or <laughs> Moet Well, there wasn't a lot of either when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought for uh, I thought for 30 years it was Moe. I was convinced uh, when I saw all those film stars drinking Moe. But in fact, uh, Moet the Chandon was created by a German guy called Francois Moet, <coughs> who met his buddy at military school, Mr. Chandon, and he moved to to France, where he became a good friend. By the way, believe it or not, of Napoleon. Uh, yes, that Napoleon. And uh, they went to military school together. So it is actually. Moet and Chandon. Hands up your new Hands up your curves. It's just yes, I'm good, man. Hands up your board. Let's keep your hands up. Obviously, we'll talk more about, about many things that you've touched upon already, but by any standard, your, your journey from whatever to where you are today has been incredible. Tell us a little bit about uh, those early days in Australia, growing up with the family. Well, I'm the oldest of nine children. Actually, my first brother died at, uh, just after childbirth, so arguably the oldest of, of ten. And uh, my mother and father, Jim and Alan, they, they raised us up. Uh, we, we actually didn't have a lot. We never felt poor, but we didn't have a lot. And I was just reminiscing, thinking, Jerry, about meeting you and talking. Actually, <laughs> Jerry and I know each other quite a while, actually. I was reminiscent about you too, but not tell all the stories. <laughs> but uh, we grew up <coughs> on a little uh, pig farm, if you could call it that, but the, the basic business was, was pigs, and uh, we didn't have a lot, but we were, we were very rich in, in love, and uh, uh, it felt like a very, very strong family unit. Uh, my father had three brothers, my Uncle Paul's here, I'm glad to say, and it, it was a remarkably close family. Um, and family meant everything. And uh, my father, of course, was my hero. Sadly, he died when I was making my first speech. I made a speech at the Harper Lager Brewery in Dundalk. And while I was on stage, he passed away with a heart attack, which was very sad. But uh, he taught us, all of us, uh, what was the right values in life, and uh, to be considerate, kind, and do the best we could. And he instilled in us uh, a real strong work ethic. All my brothers and my only sister who lives in Galway work like hell, and uh, they're not afraid of work. And I think that has stood by me very well. What value in education did, did you put? Well, you know, education was interesting <laughs> to me because I so wanted to go to university, I never got to university, but he, you know, he wanted me to get a good education. So when I passed my 11 plus, you know, you had the choice of going to some of the great schools in Newry, like the Abbey or St. Coleman's, and I chose to go to Newry Technical College. And he influenced that. He said, look, you know, as well as getting a good, solid education, it might be good to have a broad, aspect because they were teaching things like mechanical and engineering drawing, which I, I was very attracted to. So he wanted me to <laughs> back myself each way, that if it wasn't a full academia career, that it would also be something very useful. And I will tell you that Newry Technical College and Lisbon Technical College were on to do uh, mechanical and engineering drawing. And something called time and motion study. <laughs> You're all too young to know what that means. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Basically, you time people working, and they hated me. <laughs> but, uh, I loved it, and my, my only regret would be that I never got to college, so I'm very pleased that my son James graduated from this college. Had you a plan in mind? Did, did you know what you wanted to do as a young Jim? It was a friend of mine, Geoffrey Prince from Warren Point. He and I, uh, we were at Newry Technical College, and we went to Butlins and Wales to work, and we dreamed about becoming helicopter pilots in the Royal Navy. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> It was just crazy dream we had that we would come pilots and go teach us, you know, they were the best teachers, how to fly, we'd then fly commercial airlines, then we'd set up our own airline business, spraying crops over Australia. 
hard with that for a drink. <laughs> but you did have an entrepreneurial flair, did you, about the early age? Well, I was always trying to make the, uh, a dollar or a pound. Uh, I started working when I was 11 years old for a lady called Mrs. Thompson, Glen Kern Hotel, private hotel in Ostrever. I always was making money some way or other. And, uh, but I really found out the way to make good money was in the Catholic Church, so I became an altar boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, wedding, the weddings were quite good, but the real money was at the funeral. <laughs> Well, as I said, I did actually learn how to do some mechanical and engineering drawing, which is linked to time and motion study, because it's not just about timing people doing the physical act of the work. So I went into a, 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 a suit maker company called Stegan. They had factories in Ross Trevor, Donegal Road in Belfast, and Dungannon. And the idea was I would time people, but also try and figure out how you could make the machinery more efficient by moving it around, and making sure people didn't. Uh, move too far between each parts of their, their job. And uh, it was quite an interesting job, but I, I, I felt it wasn't for me, because at that time, uh, I was 18 years old, uh, we were shutting down factories. And uh, as I progressed and got promoted, I ended up shutting down a factory in Armagh myself, because my boss hadn't got the courage to do it. And you know, it broke my heart, because it's, it's one thing saying you're shutting down a factory, Another thing, you're telling people, 100 people, you have no jobs. So I said to myself, this is not for me. So where, when did you enter into the next year then? How did that come about? So again, I was trying to make a couple of bob, as the saying goes, and uh, I got to meet a guy in Australia called Sean McAleenan. Sean had a, a bar uh, on top of the town. I started working for Sean in the bar, and we became good friends. He would go away on vacation or holiday, and I would, I would go to the bar, run the bar. <laughs> Sean would come back and say, where's all my customers? Because I had them all barred. <laughs> <laughs> Richie Dick, do you remember Richie Dick? Uh, that was so funny with Richie Dick. Richie Dick said to me, seven times, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he probably could have done. But uh, one day I was in the bar, and uh, a guy called Jim O'Neill came in. Uh, some of you might know Jim O'Neill. He created a company called United Wines. He worked at that time for Guinness, or the Irish Bonding Company. And... Uh, I started giving off stink. I said, your company stinks. You don't know how to do this. You don't know how to do that. You never clean the lines. And he offered me a job. And uh, I came up to Belfast, to Severn Street. was interviewed by a friend of yours, John Lavery. And uh, he said, I'd like you to come and work for me. And I worked for John for 18 years. What year did you start? What year were we talking? 1975. And you progressed very quickly through... <laughs> well, the first, John, John was a great guy. John said, look, I'm going to give you a little bit of experience and everything. And the first day, I went to Dalamina, Railway, Railway Street, Dalamina, which we had a depot. And I was thinking, you know, I'm a sales rep, I've got my new suit, I've got my briefcase, I've, I've made it. And John says, you're working in the bottling hall. And he put me in the bottling hall, where the first guy I met was a guy called Liam Neeson. He drove a forklift truck <laughs> for Murphy's of Dalamina. And he almost ran over me. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's so nice. I, I still found him. When we met up in New York. You ended up uh, head sales. You ended up with the board off, off Guinness. And it was at a time, I suppose, when you were talking 70s and the 80s, uh, tough times in Belfast. Was, was the job as tough as, as the times were? Well, I stayed with Guinness until 1994. Uh, and uh, when I look back at it now, I, I moved to Oma, which were very difficult times. Uh, Gordon West Industrial Estate. Then up to the Apollo Road, uh, just off the Boucher Road. And I, I'll never forget, one Friday afternoon, we, my first board meeting uh, with Guinness, uh, those 13 bombs went off in Belfast. And John said at one point, during the middle of the board meeting, that was a big one. And we kept working. And it's, it's kind of, at the time I didn't realize what we were going through. At the time, uh, at one particular day, I remember it took me four hours to get to work because it was uh, strikes and the roads were blocked. Uh, but you just felt you had to do it. You just felt you couldn't give in. And, uh, and John instilled that in all of us. And, and we lost some people during that tragic time. We lost some of our drivers accidentally. And I remember going to, to the home of one of our young drivers and, and telling him, his single mother that her son had passed that morning. Very difficult, uh, but we had this determination that we would win, that we couldn't give up, 
And I can tell you that was the greatest training that I could ever get, maybe anybody. So when I look at some of the problems I have in the 50 states that I'm very fortunate to manage over in America, it's, it's a walk in the park. John eventually, well, John took very ill on and is no longer with us. Uh, but you were almost favorite to take over. <laughs> and I remember very well the time you didn't get it. <laughs> Did you have to bring that up? <laughs> this is meant to be about my success. Or something. <laughs> it, it was a it was a very very difficult period for me because John had mentored me. I'd been promoted rapidly. Uh, I had everything had been thrown at me. I seemed to be able to handle it. Uh, everyone thought that when John would pass the mantle on, that, that I would become the managing director of Guinness, and I so 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 wanted that. Not in a way that was keeping me awake at night, but it just it, it was going to mean so much to me that I'd come through the ranks and, and, and finally run the business. And I felt I could, and I felt I was ready. Uh, John fell ill. His son sadly passed away, who worked for me, uh, his, young, his only son. And it was a very sad time for John, and, and he gave it to a good friend of mine called Brian Duffy, who remains a good friend. But in a way, I think I've had two disappointments in, in career. They've actually spurred me on to do better. But they threw the dummy out of the front of the time and think, oh, well, no, leaving. no, no, I stayed on uh, and said to myself, I'm a, I'm a lifer. And Guinness did that too back then. Guinness is a very different company today, but back then Guinness was Guinness. You know, it was part of the Guinness family. It wasn't this big conglomerate called Diageo, which I had to be fortunate to a lot already work for. But uh, I was sad, but I said I would stay on. But at the same time, I got lucky. A guy called George Bull, Sir George Bull, flew over from London to meet me in Belfast. And he said, we've heard about you. We'd like you to come and work for us. And I said, uh, OK, let me think about it. And I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleep that night because I really couldn't bring myself to think, I'm going to leave Guinness. And I told a good friend of mine uh, what had happened. And he said, you know what's wrong with you? You're afraid. You're afraid to leave Guinness. So I resigned the next day. <laughs> and uh, I joined uh, Gilby's of Ireland. And in Gilby's at that stage, there was a Northern Division and a Southern Division, wasn't there? That's right. And the idea that you would join both of those together? Well, that became more my idea. Uh, we had two companies, Gilby's of Ireland, Gilby's of Northern Ireland. I took over from a gentleman you probably all know called Trevor McClintock, who used to help Barry McGregor and Barney to promote those fights with, with Brian Paul Smirnoff. And uh, my first job was uh, Gilby's Northern Ireland, but uh, I had the idea because we used a different currency. Uh, we had a different board structure. We had a, it was no common all. I couldn't believe it. Gilby's in Dublin, Gilby's Belfast. You know. So I put a proposal to the board that we should join the two companies together, recognize the government, recognize the border, recognize the, the uh, currency, but not recognize any difference in business. And uh, that turned out to be a very good thing. I was promoted to take over the business uh, in Dublin for all Ireland. We merged it together. It was very interesting. The people in the south were very concerned about a northern guy running. The people in the north were very <coughs> concerned about it becoming a southern Irish company. It was the best thing we ever did. Uh, the business uh, blossomed. The advertising became uh, uh, similar in the north and the south. And we got lots of leverage. So it became very successful. We moved from making 75 million when I took over to 150 million four years later. And from there, I'm just going to show you this little pop history of work. From there, you then got, where did you go to United? You got a call from? So, uh, what happened then is quite interesting. Gilby's was part of a company called Grand Met, bought, Grand Met bought Guinness. <laughs> so there I was back in again, and we formed this business called Diageo. So for a couple of years, I was in charge of Diageo in Ireland, you know, which is the wine and the spirit and the beer. And uh, at that time, so interesting, this comes to my, to my second disappointment. So I had become the CEO of Gilby's North and South, became the CEO of Diageo, I was living in Dublin. I had just built a little cottage uh, in Carlingford. I used to do a little bit of running, and I'd run around all the hills, and I discovered this little site one day in Carlingford, and I thought, well, man, I'd love to build a house there, which I did. And uh, I thought I'd made it. I'd become the chairman of the Wine and Spirit Association of Ireland, the only guy from the North who ever did that. And I thought, this is great. Life, life is good. <coughs> and then I got a call. So I got a call. Will I talk about it? Yes, please. I got a call by my then boss, an American guy called Jack Keenan. And I thought to myself, they couldn't really promote me again so quickly. I mean, 
what's happening here? Are they going to give me all of the UK as well? And I went into Jack. Actually, at the time, I maybe, maybe got a little bit cocky, uh, which is interesting. Nothing had really gone wrong. I'd proven to myself that John Lavery was wrong, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I said, well, okay, Jack, nice to meet you. What do you want me to do? He says, well, Jim, you have no international experience. So I said, okay. What uh, doesn't seem to do much harm to me in Dublin. <laughs> he says, well, no, we're going to move you. Uh, we're going to move you to California. <clears throat> and I said, well, Jack, I, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, uh, I, may, I maybe don't want to go to California. He says, we're not asking you. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He says, you're going to California. <laughs> so, uh, well, I was very worried. What was the job they're actually offering you? Know? Well, that's the other interesting part. Uh, job titles are very interesting. And a senior vice president uh, and, and chief operating officer of a region. So it was 18 states from Texas up to Alaska and everything in between. But for me, it felt, I was the managing director of Ireland and everything that I saw before me. So I thought this was a demotion. And, and it maybe was. It, at best, it was a sideways move, <laughs> at best. So I thought about it, and, and I remember well, there was a, a very dear cousin of mine who passed away recently, Paddy Clerkin, and I, I remember talking to Paddy, and I said, Paddy, you know, uh, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't want to do it. He said, are you crazy? If I got a chance to work in California, if I got a chance to work in America, in the business that you're in, and you've got a contract for two years, what are you worried about? So, I landed in San Francisco. So you up sticks in the year 2000, moved to San Francisco. I assume that you assumed that this was going to be the biggest learning curve in your career to date. I didn't realize how big it was going to be. I, I really, truly, uh, and I think if, if you can take any lessons from what I'm saying, uh, I really had to reinvent myself. I, I, I thought I knew all about the alcohol beverage industry. I certainly knew a little bit by that stage in Ireland. But I didn't know anything about the laws of America. Uh, there was a prohibition in 19, uh, from 1921 to 1933 in America for no alcohol. There was no alcohol produced in America, and yet it was the biggest consumption of alcohol in the history of America. <laughs> That's what prohibition does. And Al Capone made some money. But um, what was fascinating for me, every state in America, as a consequence of the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, has a different law. Every state in America manages alcohol as they see fit. And the law of the state overrules the law of the country in Prohibition. So suddenly I thought, okay, I'm going to run 18 states, no big deal. But in fact, it was like 18 countries. <coughs> and, you know, if you think about the countries or the states, Alaska, is so different than California, as you can appreciate. But it's so different in every way, not just the logistics, not just the, 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 the countryside, but the law, uh, and the types of alcohol. You know, I had to learn everything. Cold, very cold states drink very little white spirits. It's all brown, whiskey, bourbon, rum. And I had to really start all over again. And it was a bit of a shock, because I thought I'd arrive and hit the ground running. And, uh, you know, it was really, really interesting, Jerry, especially as the management team I took over took a look at me and thought, what's this guy doing here? You were resentful. Well, I had, a, I had a very interesting bunch of people. I had an Australian guy who was in charge of finance. I had an American lady in charge of sales. I had this very interesting guy from Chicago who, who was in charge of marketing. And he thought the job should have been him. He told me on the first day I arrived, you're not going to make it here, and I'm going to take your job. <laughs> He's a friend of mine today, Steve Wyans is staying. How did you handle that? I said, sit down, Steve. I'm the boss, and I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, I thought, did I really say that? <laughs> it's funny how the accent gets good in the same. But, but you, you do have to quietly assert yourself in a moment. If if people see weakness, uh, you can very easily lose respect. And if you lose respect, then you're not going to be able to do your job. And I don't mean you have to be tough, but I'm not quite sure why I said that, but I'm sure as hell glad I did say it, because that set the tone. You 
besides with Northern Ireland, besides your experiences? Well, as we went through some tough days uh, in the business, the business was not doing well. Diageo put all these business together. Everybody was fighting. They had lost the, uh, if you like, the core. Some people were Guinness. Some people were Grand Met. Some people were distillers. And there was there was a very bad, uh, I would say, atmosphere within the, and very no culture. We had to get a new culture. So things weren't good. Uh, that's for sure. It was a big business, by the way. Uh, it was a three billion dollar business uh, with twenty million cases. Uh, I mean, it, it was very sizable, but it wasn't going well. So we went through some trauma. That, you know, the business went down, and that's, when you're the boss of the company, the business going down, it's a, it's a lot of pressure. And everybody was bickering. Nobody was happy. And, and, and I called a session one day, and it's the only time I've used the story about Northern Ireland to prove a point in business, because I don't like reminiscing about the bad times. I like talking about the good times, and I like talking about the work ethic of the people of Northern Ireland uh, and Ulster. But this particular day, I was very frustrated, and I frankly didn't know what to do, and they were bitching about everything, complaining about everything. I said, listen, stop. Stop for a minute. You have no idea what a problem is. You have no idea what big issues are. Let me tell you a story. And I recounted a couple of the stories from Northern Ireland and Belfast, and I said, let me tell you, those were the days when people went to work, and they didn't know, some people didn't know depending on what your job was, if you were going to come home. <coughs> I said, those were the days when we went to work and people were dying. You guys have no problems, so sit down and let's start, start talking about running the company. Actually, that was a, a very important moment because they suddenly realized, oh my goodness, you know, this guy's been through some stuff. And uh, the team started working together. I took out one person. Almost everywhere I've been, there's one or two. I've heard stories about, you know, great leaders that go in and they take out 200 people and they fire everybody. I think that's the worst thing you can do. Think about it. Who hired those people? Why are they there? They can't all be bad. If all the people are bad, then it's the boss because he hired them, right? So, but inevitably you find this one person who's not happy or one person who thinks the job should be theirs or, or there's one person who just doesn't want to cooperate with everybody else. And it became very clear to me I had one person who remained nameless. And that person, was that your phone, Jerry? No, you spent the bloody thing off. <laughs> <laughs> You're the person who was telling them. Oh, you doing this stuff? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you think you know that, right? intellectual property of the company had gone. The whole history of Martin and Brands had gone. I normally find this one or two, and you can find, and you've got to be very careful. You've got to find the right person. And you've got to make it known why you found that person, and why that person's leaving, because everybody's watching. And you've got to replace that person by some degree. And when the people see you do that, oh, you spotted the bad guy, and you replaced them with good person, male or female, then the company starts to think, oh, okay, he knows what he's doing. But the key is not to fire 100 people, the key is to find the one or two people who are creating the obstacles. Is that your style of management? Can you be ruthless when you, when you have to be, or do you come across as this nice, jolly, friendly person who sees any problems today? Well, ruthless is not a word I, I like to use, but you've got to be firm. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, I've had to fire some people. I had to fire a good guy two weeks ago, he put the company broke my heart, great guy, worked night and day, but he, you know, there's a lot of temptation in our business. Uh, we, we deal with some beautiful brands and there happened to be alcohol in them, but he did something very wrong and, and the problem was, is you could forgive him, you could, but the rest of the company would. And you could say, did I make a little bit of a sacrifice of him? Yes. 
because I have to let the other 309 know you cannot do that. So I, I hope that's not ruthless, but I hope it's uh, a determination to show the people who work, and by the way, the people who work with me work really hard, long hours, weekends, uh, and so I have to manage the company in a way that they feel that they've been treated with respect and that we won't put up for anything other than doing the right thing. And I, I, I try to teach all the management team I have by saying, what is the right thing to do? What is the right thing? And sometimes the right things are contrary to what you might imagine. Uh, I've also forgiven the person because I thought his circumstances were highly unusual and I felt it was the right thing to forgive this person and let the company know about it. And thank goodness he's been promoted twice since. Two years that uh, you were there, what happened after the two year period? I was still in, in, uh, <laughs> still in California. Your first job still in California. California. Well, uh, the business turned around, thank goodness. We, How much did it turn we, around? We started going very fast. The thing about the alcohol beverage business, Jerry, is we have very good margins, and, and I, I won't go into the detail of that. So you, you don't have a problem where you're working on a precious little margin. The margin's good. The key is to get the brands going. I mean, the business I'm in is all about brands. People, people, it's only good things. All the bosses I know complicate life too much. You know, they worry about the P&L, they worry about the, the cost of the trucks, they worry about the cost of gasoline or, or, or petrol, as they call it. And for me, that's almost irrelevant. What is relevant is to get the brands growing and get the right people in the right jobs to help the brands grow. Because we can get those brands going, the profit flows in. A little bit of overhead doesn't really matter. Of course, we manage the overheads. I know, I know how to do that. But the key is to get the business going. So the business started going very fast. Uh, I, I was telling you earlier, it was a three billion dollar business, but it was only making at that time. I can't put this in my account. All the numbers. We were making two hundred million dollars when I went there in early two thousand, and by the time I left in two thousand three, we were making five hundred million dollars. And how long did you, you stay? Long I didn't get very much. <laughs> <about it. laughs> Rachel, just in case we some things, I could have been paid. Rachel's <laughs> not <laughs> girl. <laughs> <laughs> Five bedrooms on yours yet. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. So the two years came rapidly. And, and by the way, the two years was interesting because I left my children at home, uh, Rachel, James, and Jennifer, which is, you know, that's a big regret. I thought I'd be home in two years. Thankfully, they came out. But quickly, the two years came, and I got promoted, and, and my boss said, you know, would really like you to stay. And uh, at that stage, I'd fallen in love with America, I'd fallen in love with California, all of it, I was traveling. But I found the traveling fascinating. Then it was really fascinating, you know, going to Texas. It's, Texas is like another continent. It's massive, as you know, and you've got the border with Mexico. You know, parts of Texas you think you're in Mexico. And I had all these other great countries as a state as well, like Arizona, Ohio, Idaho. I mean, it was just fascinating. It was almost like being on a, a, a long vacation that I had to do some work. And in actual fact, I went to work on a ferry every morning. 646 ferry from a little town called Tiburon into Pier 17 in San Francisco, walked 10 minutes to the office. It was great in the morning. It was 10 times better at night because of the hell of a bar and a ferry. It was great. <laughs> so you come home from work, go to the bar, what more can the guy want? Uh, so I, I, I loved it. And, and, and the boss said to me, would you like to stay? Would we love you to uh, take on some more responsibilities? So we said to stay. Well, then, um, I'll like to back you. Who is your name? You're now getting very well known. A company called Allied de Mac is no longer in existence today, uh, but they were a big British conglomerate, the second largest uh, wine, spirit, and beer, <coughs> and hotel company in the world, uh, based in the UK. Uh, they came call they'd been calling a couple of times, but I like to think I was quite loyal, because when you think of my first 18 years with Guinness, and then Grand Met, and then Grand Met and Guinness come back together again, so arguably I was with Diageo for 25 years, 26 years. So I feel very loyal. But there's a couple of quick changes came along that I wasn't expecting. But but in America it's quite interesting. You're expected to move quite a lot. If you're in one job too long to think you're not doing well. I do not agree with that. One of the reasons I did well at Gilby's, I recruited back a man called Tom Keaveney, who was the former chairman. He was sixty seven years young. And I said, Tom, will you come back and help me? And he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, just help me, guide me, you know. And I'd lost Larry, that coach, 
had gone out of my life. John had passed on, sadly. So Tom Keaveney, you know, I, I find more mature people, if you give them what they need, which is respect, uh, make sure they, they feel valued, people, people are 70 years young can, can do remarkable work. Think of the vast experience these people have had. And the key is to get, to get it out of them uh, without them feeling like they've been used. And that worked very well for me. So, Allied Demet came along. Um, they wanted me to run a new business. It was a bit scary because it was Canada, which I'd never run a business. Mexico, where I'd never been to. Never set foot in Mexico up to this point. And the United States three countries, uh, almost 20 million cases of alcohol, $4 billion of revenue. The last four presidents have been fired in the previous five years. The business was going down like this. <laughs> but I thought, yeah, I remember once what my father said to get in when the going so bad it can't get any worse. <laughs> and you look like a hero when you start smoking. And so I looked at it and I thought, could it get any worse? And, uh, but I thought, I thought I was ready. I thought I was ready. Uh, I was worried about Canada and Mexico because I hadn't got a clue. But then I remember something else my dad said. Uh, my dad said to me once, when I was trying to get this, he said, listen, I don't know how good you are and you're probably not that good. So make sure you get good people around you. And you've all heard that. So, so important. It's not a matter of just getting good people. There's lots and lots and lots of good people. It's getting good people in the right jobs. I have seen so many horrible situations where great people <coughs> do the wrong job, end up getting fired, end up getting disappointed, everybody's frustrated. So the key for me, one of my, I think, biggest successes is finding people who fit the right job, mentoring them, coaching them, and then letting them go. Not been afraid to let them go. So I took up the job in uh, Westport, Connecticut. I moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. <coughs> that was a shocker. Uh, we had two feet of snow the day I moved. Uh, from the sunshine of California, and uh, but it was a great business. And uh, how, how did you turn it around? Well, I hired two very good people: to one to run Canada, one to run Mexico, because I couldn't be everywhere. I found the bad guy who who, who was the star of the company, uh, but he was he was very destructive, full. He was he was creating anxiety for the sales and the marketing function. And uh, the other thing I discovered in America, you know, people want to know, are you going to run a sales company? Or are you going to run a marketing company? <clears throat> and I said, no, we're going to run a brand company. The whole idea is to get the brands going. If you can get your brands moving, whatever that brand is, <coughs> uh, that's the key. And to get the right people in the right jobs to get the brands moving. So when I got in there, we had a big business, as I just told you. Uh, we had 300 million dollars of advertising and promotional money, which is significant even today. Um, and those 300 million dollars were divided over uh, literally hundreds of brands. You know, brands like Kahlua, Stolich Neue, Maker's Mark, great brands. But So I called my team away, and I normally call the team in and said, let's figure out what we know here. What, what do we have? What is going on? And I realized 300 million was a lot, but the 300 million was spread over all the brands. So some brands were getting 2 million, some brands were getting 5 million. And we made a bet, I flew to London to my boss, Philip Bowman, and I said, I think our monies are too dissipated. Uh, we're not making big bets. We need to get four, five, six of these brands really going. And he said, well, what do you think we should do? And I said, I think we should take the 300 million and pump it all into 10 brands. And he said, well, what about the other brands? I said, I think they'll slow down, but I don't think they'll collapse. Great brands never collapse. Great brands, even if you're not investing enough, will, will continue to go on a little bit. So he said, that's a big gamble. <laughs> that's when you really feel you're earning your money. And uh, you feel the weight suddenly go on the shoulders. And I said, yeah, it is a gamble, but..." I'm convinced if we get the right advertising. <coughs> and so we took in new agencies, we briefed the agencies, we told them what we want to do, and we put all the money on 10 brands. We put all 10 brands on television, we put all 10 brands on outdoor 
who had the money to do it, outdoor campaign. So everywhere you went, you know, you, you couldn't miss these ten brands. And the two <coughs> six of them took off. Um, actually, so successful was it that your competitors at the time, Jim Bean and uh, Ricard, Colonel Ricard, they actually were so envious, they, they bought I they jumped back to the we, we became the fastest growing in America. We were flying. Uh, I was trying to get my boss to buy Jim Bean. I thought we should have bought Jim Bean. And uh, I was driving to work one morning at 7.15, and I heard on the radio that Colonel Ricard had launched uh, a bid to buy us. And within four months, uh, they had it bought us. They couldn't raise all the money themselves. It was 15 billion pounds. And so they borrowed 5 billion pounds from Bean. And 10 billion from Perna Ricard that took us out. And that was that was a very, very challenging. I, I never thought I could feel as bad as that. Because even though we were so successful, even though we were the fastest growing, even though it was a recognition of how well we had done, the two companies wanted all the brands, they didn't want all the people. And that was heartbreaking, you know, and it goes right back to my early days with Stegan shutting down factories. You know, you, you work hard with these people and all of a sudden you tell them you have no job. And uh, they took some people. Did they want you? <laughs> well, I, I was very fortunate. Both of them offered me a contract. Uh, I still have the one I did not sign, Colonel. And Beam offered me uh, to run the bigger, newer, uh, enlarged company for again Mexico and Canada and the US. And I thought to myself, okay, I've had the good fortune of running an Irish company, I've had the good fortune of running an American company, sorry, a British company. I thought, wouldn't it be good to run an American company? And there's nothing more American than Bean, Urban. So I joined Bean as the CEO for those three companies. How long did that last? <laughs> well, I, I did a crazy thing there. I started commuting every Monday morning. I, I would leave. I decided not to move the family anymore. We've been moving all over the place as you are gathered. And I said, maybe I could do this by commuting. And uh, I would leave home at 4.30 on a Monday morning. Uh, drive to a place called White Plains, get a little commuter airline, and because Chicago is one hour behind New York, I could get in my office at 8 o'clock. I was the first one in the office, even though I commuted from New York. But that was difficult. Uh, the commutes were, were really difficult. <coughs> difficult getting there, 10 times worse than getting back from Chicago or her on a winter's night when they're canceling flights all over the place. And by the, by the winter, that seven Friday nights in a row turned into a Saturday. I said, I'm not going to do this much longer. So you were ready to leave? I was. I was. That was a great job, but the commute was too much. So did you get the phone call from Maud Hennessy before you decided to leave or after you decided to leave? So in 2000, I met a, a guy called Christophe Navarre, who's my boss. Uh, I met him in California. Mm -hmm. He called me. He called me when Beam has been sold, when Allied Demand has been sold. So I've been talking to him for a couple of years, and he kept in touch. He and I are friends, as well as the fact that I report to him. So he'd been calling and said, "I'd really like you to come. You know, we've got problems in New York. The, the business isn't going as well. Champagne is going down." And uh, so by the time I had spent two and a half years with, with Beam, very successful. The business, the business went great. We started up completely new business in Mexico, which was also great, and uh, learned a lot there. Learned how to cut agave in the agave fields. A little bit different than the <coughs> fields, but <laughs> they're very prickly, be careful. And uh, oh, what? Agave. It makes tequila. You ever have one of those, Jared? No, but I'm sure we will have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of my brands. Uh, so, uh, Christoph called and asked me to move to New York, and uh, in June 2008, I did. And he offered you the job as president and CEO, which oh. is, must have been one of the biggest honors ever received by you. Such an iconic brand. Well, I've been in business now 36 years, and uh, I feel very fortunate, but if you're going to end your career in alcohol, which I probably will end my career in alcohol with this company, it's the top of the top. With only 13 brands, but uh, they're, they're pretty iconic. I remember when I walked into my local pub uh, in Westport, Connecticut one day, uh, my buddy's uh, 
It's so funny, I have all these nicknames for my buddies. One of them's called Bobby Jones. He likes to be called as the great Bobby Jones. <laughs> well, one of them's called Pat Kennedy, and he introduced himself as Senator Kennedy here. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble with Pat, he believes it. <laughs> he came to the event with me two weeks ago, I swear this is true, we're in the New York Athletic Club, and uh, Eamon Coughlin, Senator Eamon Coughlin, runs his event for um, the Children's Hospital, in, uh, along with uh, Graham McDonald. And Graham does a super job for the, for the Children's Hospital in Dublin. And uh, I invited Pat, and I turned around and here, Senator Pat Candy here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he now believes it. But, uh, where won't we turn? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the brands are iconic. I walked into the bar one night called Bogies. Can you imagine the bar was called Bogies? But that's what it's called. I passed what the hell is that company? What, what are you guys doing there? So I didn't want to explain Moe Hennessy and Louis Vuitton, Moe Hennessy and all that. I said, do I work for Don Perignon? I says, I work for Don Perignon. He says, holy. I said, well, I've also got Moton Chandon. Yeah, what? <laughs> so we've got 13 of the most iconic brands. What are those brands? Yeah, what well, I guess the best known are, are, is Don Perignon, which is uh, you know, vintage, one of the greatest vintage of, of champagne on earth. Uh, we have other champagnes called Crude, uh, which sells for somewhere between $200 and $1,000 a bottle. Uh, Brunar, which is a little boutique champagne, but beautiful. Bowden Chandon, of course, is the biggest in the world. And then we have a bunch of spirits like Belvedere Vodka, which is uh, one of the oldest, most traditional vodkas on earth from Poland, 600 years old. Glamourangi is a scotch, uh, along with Hard Bag. Uh, we have a brand called Grand Marnier, which is an orange kind of liqueur. But of course, the biggest one, and one that makes me feel very proud uh, because of his Irish heritage, is Hennessy. And Hennessy is the largest selling cognac world is the largest selling contact in America and uh, you know the, the, brand, the brands just mean so much if you're an alcohol these are the brands you want to work with. It's LV HL, what, LV is Louis Vuitton, what, what's the connection between the LV and the HL and the, uh, and the HM side? So uh, Bishop Bernard Arnault is the owner, the largest shareholder, he, he bought a company called Louis Vuitton which is you know is luxury uh, baggage and, and uh, luxury shoes, items and leathers. And then he bought Maud Chandon, right, right. Then he bought Hennessy, and he thought he'd put it all together. By the way, the whole group, which is amazing, it's only 30 years old. Uh, Louis Vuitton, Maud Hennessy is 30 years old. He put it all together, and uh, he just reported his results on Tuesday night, and they made 3 billion euros. And he put that thing together himself. He, he started doing it when he was 36. Now that's, that's an entrepreneur. Have you any connection with that side? Well, I actually work for LVMH. Yeah. Uh, that's who employs me. I happen to run the wine, the champagne, and the spirit business, but I work for LVMH. I present to Michel Arnaud three times a year. It's, it's quite the experience. He has the largest boardroom I've ever seen in my life overlooking the Eiffel Tower. It's, it's, quite, it's quite intriguing and quite challenging, but he's very inspiring. Uh, he, he's all about brand equity, uh, brand desirability. Make the brands uh, desirable, and people will pay good money for them. So where, where, where are the big growth markets in, in Champagne, for example? Uh, well, China has gone through uh, a very challenging time. Uh, China was the last to go, but now it's very challenged because there is a clamp down by the government on luxury giving and gifting. Uh, because I don't know if you know or not, I'm sure you do, but China has 80 million civil servants and government ministers. 80 million. Do you think Strong's bad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, actually we're doing very well in the market, Jerry. Uh, we, we have the business growing. 2008 and 2009 was awful. The day that Lehman Brothers closed their doors, champagne sales took a dive. And even the rich guys would not be seen drinking champagne. There was a very anti-wealth situation created after the banks collapsed. But the business is back up again. Don Perignon is growing. And more, more um, faster growing markets are actually Eastern Europe, Poland, not so much Russia today because Russia is through drama, but Eastern Europe is doing very well. But we're doing good in the US, thank goodness. The economy in the US is rebounded. Uh, I often think that Barack Obama needs a, a better PR person because he's been polarized by everybody, but yet he saved the car industry. Unemployment is 5.6%. What would we give for that? 5.6% unemployment. The stock market is the highest level 
in the history of America. So, you know, he, maybe he got lucky at the end, but he has a few things that worked out pretty good for him. What, what, what is your, what did you bring to the party to, to, to when, when you got the job at the North? What did you bring? What, what are the qualities in you, Jim, that have taken you from Australia to where you are, to running countries, to running vast amounts of money? <coughs> well, I'll go right back to where I started. You know, I started working at 11 years old. I, I, I have a very strong Ulster work ethic. Uh, I'm not afraid to work. I, I work as hard today, maybe not as hard physically, but I work 80 hours a week. Uh, I remember going to the Harvard Business School in Switzerland, Graham met something there. And the guy says, how, how many hours do you work? Uh, and I says, I, you know, I don't know, 70, 80 hours. And he said, well, you're not doing it. You, you can't do your job. If you can't do your job in 40 hours, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, I think I'll bunk on I mean, maybe I'm not good enough, but I, I work a lot. And, and uh, I keep an eye on, I'm reading, I read every document that I need to. But the core of the question is, what, what makes the difference? And leaving aside, if you don't work hard, you're not going to get there unless you're Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, uh, you know, these geniuses that you meet every night again. And even Warren Buffett works like hell. Um, I think it's about recognizing what your business is. Meaning, I was given 13 brands to look after. Dead simple. I was given 13 brands to leave in better shape when I go than when I got them. So, you know, again, I looked at the PL, I looked at the volumes, I looked at the market share, I looked at the Nielsen tracking, the IRI tracking, I looked at the revenues. It doesn't matter. What matters is what are you going to do to get those brands growing? How do you add value, make them more attractive, make them more uh, brand equity? And then, to do that, you have to get the right people. Once you get the right people, then, you know, there's a little work. You've got to pull in your agencies. You've got to say what Don Brandon stands for. You've got to say what uh, Belvedere stands for. And you build great campaigns, if, if you're lucky. And in the case of Hennessy, we, we created a campaign, and I would like to take a little bit of credit for this one, uh, through my son's connection with, with top rank boxing, I met uh, Bob Arum and I met Manny Pacquiao, and uh, Manny Pacquiao was a phenomenal guy, and he gives you this impression of someone who never stops, never settles. He's won a world championship uh, at ten different weights. He grew up in the streets. He's a he's a government minister in the Philippines, and we built this campaign around Hennessy and thinking about the consumer. I mean, at the end of the day, I should say to you, the consumer <coughs> is the king. That's the maple break. But if you know your consumer and you get your brand talking to the consumer, and in this case, we said to Manny Packy, would you help us make a commercial? I'm going to call it Never Stop, Never Settle. And we put it on to Hennessy. It's won every award that you can win in advertising. It's now its fourth season. Uh, Hennessy was minus 7% when I went in there. Last year we finished plus 12. It's 2.5 million cases, the fastest growing big brand in America. So what happened? We got the right people with the right brand insights. We created a brilliant campaign. I didn't, my marketing guy did in the agency, although I facilitated it, and the consumer decides. All your brands are associated with luxury. Do you deliberately market that way? Yes. LBMH Group prides itself in being the biggest, best luxury goods company on earth, so we will never see one of our, we will never buy a brand, we'll never have a brand that sells at 9 or 10 dollars. The cheapest brand I have is 30 dollars. That's the cheapest, but it goes up to 5,000 um, dollars. And you've got to be very careful about that because you can't be seen to be aloof. You, you can be seen to be prestige, uh, luxury, uh, but not aloof. And uh, that's a bit of a trick in itself. Am I right considering the champagne region is, is quite small? There are, well, there are only so many bottles of champagne per year. Yes, Am I right on that? That, that's true. That's true. But with, you know, the world's a fascinating place. One year America's down, next year Russia's up or down, right now Russia's down. It seems to balance. Right now there's uh, there's enough champagne to satisfy the current needs. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 It'd be very high quality problem if it didn't have enough champagne to satisfy the needs. Uh, whenever you Google, I don't know if you Google Jim Clark, uh, you'll see, and put in the images, and you'll see Jim Clark in the top, some of the top. Uh, <laughs> 
film stars in America, some of the top <coughs> Is your life, is it a show busy life now that you're Some people would argue <coughs> that we're not really an alcohol. Uh, and while I respect the fact that we have alcohol uh, and we have to be very socially responsible, I'm vice chairman of the Distilled Spirits Council of America because I'm absolutely convinced that you know, if we're going to sell alcohol, we have to be responsible. And someone underage is bad news for us. Someone getting drunk is very bad news for us. Because that's not what we're about. Some people would argue we're in entertainment. And consequently, we sponsor a lot of uh, events in the world of entertainment, like the Golden Globes, for example, uh, the Oscars. We did, although I gave it up recently because we weren't getting a return on the investment. We weren't getting any imagery for our brands. It was a big decision to give up the Oscars, but we did. Uh, we will not give up the Golden Globes because it's so powerful for the brand image. Uh, so there is a lot of entertainment. There is a lot of uh, events. We Last year, the little company I run with my 310 people, uh, we did 14,000 events. <coughs> now, some of them are big events at the Golden Globes. Some of them are a, a dinner for 10 people tasting high-end cognac, but 14,000. Now, you might think, how is that possible with 310 people? There's a three-tier system in America, which means I have wholesalers, and we have 3,200 wholesaler reps working for us. But each one of those 14,000 events has to be well-managed, and it has to have a good perception of luxury or entertainment, as you say. And uh, that's, that's where we talk to our consumers. That's where we bring luxury into the real world, where people can enjoy the experience. How do you involve many of those 14,000? <laughs> Uh, too many. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot. You sure have a stall with a very famous person. <laughs> uh, you told me this morning. Jerry, Share it with us. Jerry's reminded me. Uh, well, we sponsored the Golden Globes and I've been five times. I'm sorry, Rachel, I promise you you'll go some year. I promise you. I promise you. Uh, so the Golden Globes is fantastic because it's, it's an event that's a dinner. And you are literally seated beside all these iconic stars, wonderful people, some very, very strange people, uh, and some great people. But anyway, he's referring to a story I told three years ago. I went to the bathroom. Um, I probably shouldn't tell you it was in the bathroom, but I have to tell you the truth. Uh, I went to the bathroom at the Golden Globes in Hilton Hotel in, in, in Hollywood. And I, I noticed this sort of shadow come up to my left, and he was very tall, and I looked over. And I love Clint Eastwood. I mean, I've adored Clint Eastwood since I was a kid. And uh, I always remember looking at cowboy movies. My uncle Paul's out there, and his father, Billy Farrell, just loved the movies. We would always watch. My uncle, uh, my grandfather, never forgive John Wayne. He shot Liberty Valance in the back. <laughs> he shot Liberty Valance in the back. But uh, we loved the cowboy movies. So there was my hero, Clint Eastwood. And I said, uh, hello, Mr. Eastwood. <laughs> what about you, kid? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally true. And uh, I didn't know what to say. And I said, uh, are you going to the bar there? He said, uh, I'm meeting Bono. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and he didn't say anything. I was like, oh, okay, that's me. That's me shut down. And he's about to go. He pulls up the zipper and he's heading out. Watched his hands, he watched his hands. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey kid, you want to join us? <laughs> and I, I had a beautiful night with Clint. He, he's a fantastic man. He's six foot six. He's 82. He has a body like a 39 year old. He's unbelievable shape. He's very articulate, very nice. And of course, Bono is a sensation the work that Bono's doing. Uh, to try and eradicate AIDS in Africa, and his wife, Ali Houston, uh, you know, Bono's called Paul. He's very, Bono's great, but when you're with Bono, and he's, there's no audience, he, he insists you call him Paul. And, uh, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of great stars like that who, who are lovely. There's a couple of head cases, by the way, also. Uh, Remember the pink farm in Russia? Yes. Well, uh, if people, along, say, <laughs> <laughs> if people didn't know where the pig farm was, they could sure as hell smell it. <laughs> But I'm very friendly today with a guy called John Legend, uh, who you might know. He, last year he had the biggest uh, song on earth, but you know, he's a real down to earth, decent guy. He just married to a girl called Chrissy, and they're lovely, lovely people. 
And uh, it's a tough, that's a real tough life, you know. <laughs> if you're running a company, you get to know a few people and you like the private time. I really like, you know, private time, you'd be on my own. Uh, when Rachel and I go down to the PJ O'Hara's bar in, in, in Carlingford, we just want to hang out. They never get a minute. It, it's a very, very tough life. What's your working week? What's your typical working week? I'm always in the office at 7.30. Uh, it's just something I've always done. Uh, Monday. I try to keep Sundays completely free. I have a lot of events on Saturdays. So, uh, there are there are meetings. I, I had a meeting at 8 o'clock every Monday morning with my executive team. We review the week going past and we talk about the week that's coming up. And then we talk for about 20 minutes or some more of the bigger strategic issues uh, that are coming down the track in the next six months, eight months, or even two years. Then there will likely be a series of meetings. I stay very close to the brands. I always want to know what the brands are doing, uh, what uh, advertising is coming up, how is the latest campaign developing. Uh, I want to know about the brand health measures. You know how how the consumers seeing the brand. So I have a lot of meetings with the marketing team. Uh, Externally, I have wholesalers coming in to see me. We're obviously important to our wholesalers. We have this number. I have a wholesaler. I was at a wedding uh, on Saturday. I was the only non-family, only non-Jewish. All the wholesalers in America are Jewish people. We have, we have hard work in the industrious people. And I went to this wedding in Miami. Our wholesaler in Miami, called Southern Wines and Spirits, last year did $11.2 billion. It's a father and son operation. Only in America. <laughs> so I would normally leave the office about seven o'clock at night, and four nights, at least four nights a week, I'll have some form of event. And you're also on the global executive leadership team, which takes you all over the world. Well, that's fascinating. I joined the, uh, the, the the global exec team, so it, it takes me to places, you know, all over the world. Uh, I, I had never been to China until I joined the exec team. And why it's fascinating for me is to get to see all these other uh, amazing countries, uh, cultures. But you know, it's so interesting. Uh, people are complicated. I still look at the business in China or Russia or India the same way as I look at the business in Ireland. You've got consumers. You've got brands. How do you <coughs> bring them together? And, and if, there, if there's one message I would say to everyone, when you're looking at your own business or, or, or looking at what to do, what, what is it you're trying to do? Imagine how, if you want to get somewhere, you're there, and then trace your steps back. <coughs> and in my business, it's very simple. Look after the brands, and the brands will look after us. Everything we've spoken about today, it's all very rosy. You've moved seamlessly from one job to the next. Were there mistakes along the way? Were there bad decisions along the way? Anything you regret? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I make mistakes every single day. Uh, the key for me is to not make big ones uh, or to try and avoid big ones. Um, I'm, I'm pushing a whole new agenda, which I know virtually nothing about. Rachel will tell you, my daughter, I can hardly switch on my iPhone. So I'm, I'm technically challenged, but I've hired in experts for the world of digital, for example. And we ran a campaign uh, in the US for, for Belvedere Vodka. It was edgy very edgy. Uh, we were posting uh, uh, every day Facebook, uh, all sorts of messages going out to, to capture the whole new millennial world of digital. And uh, one of the campaigns went out without my people checking it, and it was bad. It, 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 was, it was distasteful. It, it, it was wrong. Uh, and, you know, it was my watch. So by the time I found out about it, noon, on Friday afternoon, we had 20,000 people writing that they hated Belgium, <coughs> that we were sexist, uh, and, and I, had a, I had a crisis on my hand. And uh, the mistake was I had given too much freedom uh, to the agency to send these posts out. <coughs> and I keep saying to you, look after the brand, and that was, one, that was one good example, I was not looking after the brand. <coughs> we're near the end, I've got some speaker for an hour, and I'm sure there are a few questions. What's the state of uh, MH at the moment? What's, what's the sort of turnover of the year? What, what are you doing? Well, I, I can't talk too much about the global business, but I can tell you that the business that I have the privilege of managing and running with about 310 people, uh, we did over $2 billion last year. Uh, we sold 5.5 million cases of those brands I mentioned. 
I, I cannot disclose the profit, but I can tell you the profit was up at double digits, very handsomely. So we're the fastest growing wine and spirit company in America today, I'm glad to say. And what Jim just forgot to there's a case for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> meeting ahead of, of 2015 was how can we do better. Uh, that never stopped, never settled the mantra. It seems to be eating, eating me up and I want to keep going and doing more. But I think, first of all, I'm never going to retire, ever. But I can't keep doing this. So I will, hopefully, if people think I'm worth something, uh, try and join a couple of boards. I, I, I have dual citizenship now and, and an American citizen. <coughs> I'll never give up my Irish citizenship, and I feel very good about that. I would like to be on a couple of boards in America, and a couple in Europe, preferably Ireland, so that I could spend time in both countries. That, that would be, if my health holds up, um, that's what I would like to do. Because I think, I think now today, I can add value to, to an executive team by I've become quite good at asking the right questions. And I'm not afraid to make a decision. I just want to finish up with your work with Cooperation Ireland because I do want to mention that Chairman of Cooperation Ireland for many years in America. And you're very proud of that role and it's a very important role. Well, I am. Uh, when I moved to, I think, in fact, you did a lot of work for Cooperation North. That's right, that was the original name. Many, many. And when I moved to Dublin, I joined the board and it was called Cooperation North. And your guest speaker of two years ago, uh, Mr. Norton. Yes, Martin Norton. His wife, Carmel, was the, the chairman. That's right. And I took over from her in Ireland. And Carmel and I decided, with a bit of a risk, to change it from Corporation North to Corporation Ireland because it didn't make sense to me unless we had Corporation anywhere. And while we called it North, and there was a reason because we wanted to make sure that the Protestant and the Catholic communities felt that they were united in the North, uh, it became evident to us that we had to open it up a little bit more and call it Corporation Ireland. So I, I, I love the work uh, because I think it's important to try and help promote this, this good, slightly fragile kind of piece. But the real work is reconciliation. The real work is to get people who have hatred to forgive and and to want to live together because I keep, when I look at Northern Ireland, when I look at Ulster, and see the hard work, see how well educated people are in places like this. 60,000 alumni, uh, I'm glad my son James is one of them. Uh, it's wonderful, and with so much more to do, uh, we need more jobs, better jobs, better paying jobs. Uh, through Corporation Ireland, I'm trying to bring jobs here. I did a lot of work last year. Uh, uh, with Mayor Martino Mueller, who, who, forget about whatever you think of his politics, that guy works really hard for Belfast, and he brought working groups out to New York, he brought working groups back here. And so for me, it's all about education, and the more mixed education we can get, the better. Newry Technical College was great for me, it was mixed. I never knew any other way of growing up, you know, you grew up with people of different religion, races, what does it matter, are we all people? And I think religion, uh, you know, is, is an issue that can be put away when you get education great jobs. So Corporation Ireland is all about that, uh, and I, I, I believe in it passionately. My dream, my vision, is to shut it down. When it's shut down, you don't need it, the place is going to be in good shape. The sooner the better. One final question, you, you, you know the drink straight inside, right? and as you know in Northern Ireland, you know, public clothes seemingly one every other day. What advice would you give to, to businesses? Yeah, not just pubs. People are in trouble. Yeah, well, the pubs is mad. I, I am astonished to see what's happening. You know, when I went to Dublin, the pubs were changing for five million euros. Mind you, I couldn't work out. I mean, I'm looking at the P and A and thinking, wait a minute, that their revenues 
uh, or a million a year. You can't, you can't sustain that. It, it, it was a bubble. It was a crazy bubble. Well, here's my advice to, well, really anybody in business, well, particularly those people who are in the uh, hospitality business, you've got to reinvent yourself. You know, how, how far back you go, the pub I ran, at the top of the town in Strafford, you couldn't have got a sandwich. It was a good pub, but you couldn't have got a sandwich. And, and I'm not kidding. You might have got a packet of peanuts, uh, if you were lucky, if Richie Dick hadn't stolen them. Um, <laughs> but I think you've got to reinvent yourself. And, you know, the pubs are doing, I mean, I look at Bill, what Bill Wills is doing around Belfast, and he has done a fantastic job investing millions and millions, <coughs> taking, taking some very big risks. I think you've got to remember that we're in the hospitality business, if you're in a pub or a bar or a restaurant or a hotel, the consumer is king and you have to diversify. Does that mean that your bar suddenly builds on four rooms for coming in? Does that mean your bar that serves hamburgers suddenly starts bringing in <coughs> fish? Does that mean that you start your bar being used as part of the hospitality and the tourist industry and doing tours? You, you have to reinvent or you're going to die. If you don't reinvent yourself, you're going to go down and business is tough. But the future's bright for the North, I think. <coughs> tourism is going to... We haven't touched the tourism part here yet. I, I think tourism <coughs> can be massive. You know, I meet hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in America. And uh, I'm going to make one political point in a second. And they say, oh, we've been to Ireland. Oh, we've been to the Cliffs of Moher. Oh my goodness, the Ring of Kerry is beautiful. We've been to Northern. Oh, no. Oh. So there's still a lot, little bit of resistance. And we've got to get them here. Because once you get them here, they love it. And once you get them here, I mean, I took four, I took that gentleman, Mr. Chaplin from Miami, his business is 11 billion. I took him to Newcastle four years ago on his private jet. And uh, he took me. Uh, and he paid for it. Uh, I took him there and I went to Royal County Down. I'd never played golf in Royal County Down. I grew up in Australia, 14, 15 miles away. I was a member of Warren Point Golf Club for 22 years, but never played golf because I played squash. And I wish I'd taken off golf earlier. You meet weird people. But we played Wild County Down with a guy called Marvin Schenken, who is the largest magazine owner in America, Wine Spectator, Cigar Viciano, the largest retailer in Florida. And we come off the course, we went to the bar, I got high to Smithwick's, and uh, we're sitting there, and I said, what do you think? And Wayne Chapman, who's a very nice guy, very literally very nice, he said, you know what? This is Pebble Beach on steroids. <laughs> I mean, it is beautiful. And so we got, if we get them here, so here's my political point. Uh, I go to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Irish events. Uh, the Taoiseach has appointed Minister Jimmy Dinahan as the Minister of the Diaspora. We have no one to go to. There's nobody looking after the Northern Irish Diaspora. And you might say, well, you don't need it. You, you know, what, what are you talking about? You go to all those events. We want the people of Australia, the people of Canada, the people of America, we want something we can contribute to. And by the way, the ones that are quite successful want to give something back. Be it jobs, be it referring someone to come here on vacation, spend some money. So my appeal to Stormont is to say, okay, maybe you can't afford to give us a minister with nothing else in the portfolio. Why not add it in to somebody else's portfolio? Why can't we have one of the current ministers also look after the diaspora of Northern Ireland? I think we should. Yeah, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, as Jim said, I've known him for more than 30 years, and he's still the same man today that he was 30 years ago. A lot more of a man. <laughs> talking about your career, you were talking about the people who inspired you. How important do you think it is for people who have mentors and coaches in your role as you're growing? Because I'm actually working as a coach and um, it's 
in Ireland, we, we actually always kind of take a step back towards getting assistance. Is there times in your career where you've actually reached out to people and actually asked for assistance to do things, and it, how did it benefit your career? I'm really glad you asked that question. I think it's absolutely critical, and I think people in Northern Ireland tend to be afraid of that. There's a little bit of a stigma. Oh, you know, you can't be seen to be asking someone for advice or counsel or coaching or help. I think it's critical. As long as you get the right person who really cares about you. You might recall I talked about John. I moved to Dublin and I brought back my 67 year old chairman. By the way, Tom worked with me for seven years, the best guy I ever worked with. He, was, he became my new coach. I think it's critical. I have a mentor coaching program in the company. In fact, every company I've been to, I set up immediately a coaching program. If you're one of my executives, it has to coach one or two people. It has to. Um, and I, I think it's it's powerful. If you have, here's the thing. We, we, it doesn't matter at what level of business you're at. It doesn't matter what level of education you're at. It doesn't matter how successful you are in Jerry. You always want to talk to someone off the court. You want to say, you know what? I haven't got a clue what to do about this. <laughs> What do you think? You can't do that in front of your, your executive team because you're supposed to know everything, right? But if you can sit down and say, hey, Jerry, can I tell you something? I, I have a real problem here, and I really I really don't know what to do about this. What, do you, what would you think? Now, by the way, if you have a good coach, he might say, I, I haven't, Jerry probably doesn't say this, I haven't got a clue either. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but you listen to it, and what it does is really make you think about a different point of view, and it it helps you make better decisions. So, yes, coaching, mentoring, at every level, I think is very important. <coughs> I think we'll take one more. Going to take one more. It's not. It's not a question. It's just to add to exactly what you said. Uh, I've had, I started out from small farming background, but you have had a degree of success and I've had the great pleasure of being on the board uh, with Fergal of Intertrade Ireland. But one of the things that has given me one of the things that has given me the most pleasure in business is just exactly what you're saying is that mentoring. And I have two young colleagues sitting beside me here today, and I'm so privileged that they've had the opportunity to hear you. And I, all I want to say is just to say exactly that uh, mentoring and bringing on. And I'm 70 year old now, and again, just exactly, I'm still involved with the company, and I'm very, very fortunate, and I'm delighted, and I totally concur uh, with your sentiments, sir. Thank you very much. And it's been an honour. Is Maria McManus in the room? Stand up, Maria. How do you always do this? <laughs> Maria McManus is uh, a former student uh, here from Northern Ireland, and she's the last intern that I took out from Old Hensley and Hensley, and she's the fourth. The other three are working for the company now full time. Maria is interviewing soon, I hope. The other thing that I like to do is bring interns in, uh, not just the coaching and the mentoring, but let them experience. What brand did you work on, Maria? Wendy Say it again? Wendy What was that like? <laughs> Where are you from? Kishinaw. I'm saying you again. <laughs> <laughs> We just, we just have a new, um, just have a new mentor who arrived, a professor from the University of Ulster, Amor Glass, arrived on Monday. She went to her first event with us, uh, a presentation on Hennessy Roadshow. I think it's fantastic, and I wish I had more. By the way, I will say this: I should say it because Maria's in the audience. Those young people who came to the company after Dublin Managing have made me so proud. You know, to come over with this funny crazy accent, nobody understands a word they're saying, <laughs> and by the time they leave the valley, the master value, and people come to you and say, can we not get some more of those people from Belfast? Well done, Ray. Realize how beautiful Northern Ireland is. 
Uh, people don't, and, and you know, if we think of the images of Northern Ireland, a lot of it's around Belfast, and of course the city hall is sensational. But I, I would, I would, if I was trying to promote Northern Ireland, I would have uh, more of the culture and the events we do. Some of the events we're now doing, I think, in Northern Ireland are fantastic. And the people come out of the street. But I would spend a lot of time and effort on the countryside showing the coast. I mean, the Antrim coast, uh, the Moor Mountains, is, is sensational. I think those pictures of Northern Ireland speak more than a million words if you get the right. Uh, and by the way, if you can get a comedy over it, I mean, we could Liam Neeson to talk about Northern Ireland. His voice is sensational. The guy's one of the biggest film stars. He loves his country. He loves the North. He's a great ambassador. Uh, but I would do more, not so much about the business or the work. You could put that in. I would show those images of the beautiful countryside we have. Because it is truly beautiful. I got another whole hour. Uh, folks, we're going to leave. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, just to finally say, uh, it is worth the thanks to you. Please welcome the man uh, who's probably able to put the whole thing together, Professor Ferguson McCall. Vice Chancellor and Provost of the Belfast Campus, Professor Alistair Adair, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, on your behalf and on behalf of TUP KFFPM, I would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to Jim Clerken uh, for sharing his inspirational leadership experiences and common sense comments with us here this morning. Personally, I've known Jim for almost 40 years, and him and Jerry joke back to the time that uh, Jim was chairman of the judging panel of the Rose of Tree, which yours truly invited to do. And Jerry was compare and fortune with yours truly invented to do. And uh, I suppose in those days I was the thorn, I was the chairman of the Ulster Rosa Tralee Committee. But they were great crack and great fun. So then I think Jim will go back again on the And uh, I've observed and admired his spectacular rise to the very top in corporate business in Ireland, Europe, and America. And currently in his role as obviously CEO and President of Moat Hennessy USA. As he's already said, being part of the global team of LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moat Hennessy, the world's largest luxury goods company. And under his direction and leadership, many liquor brands in both the US and international markets have gained prominence with leading market share positions and greatly increased profitability. Throughout his career, Jim has also been very conscious of corporate social responsibility and has been very generous in his commitment to not-for-profit organisations. He has been a champion, as we've already heard, for promoting peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland, including his good efforts in recent years as chairman of Corporation Ireland in the USA. However, Jim carries his success with great dignity, and he has never forgotten his Restrever roots and friends, and they certainly haven't forgotten him as a very clearly evidence today, Jim, by the large, should I say a red and black or a Strever contingent here today. Yes. <clears throat> It is very interesting that Jim regularly recalls, as we heard again this morning, and I've heard him say on a number of occasions, advice given to him by his father, as some of the best advice he has ever received. One such quote, and I didn't know what Jim was going to say today, but it's in my speech. Remember, you're not that good, so you better get good people around you. In any review of Northern Ireland's distinguished business entrepreneurs and visionary sales and marketing leaders, the name of Jim Clerken, will always be prominent, and we're very honoured he honoured us today. It takes two to chat, and I'm sure you will all agree that Jerry Kelly once again gave a par excellence performance. All Jerry Kelly's experience, including not one, his current two BBC radio shows, and the regularly topping the viewing ratings in Northern Ireland with the Kelly Show on UTV for 17 consecutive years, was very evident, I think you'd agree, this morning. Central to this enormous achievement in broadcasting is the man himself, Jerry Kelly. And today his class and attention to detail in terms of research and delivery were once again clearly demonstrated in an exquisite performance. Thank you very much, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Listening and observing Jim Clerken, I am very conscious that if you look after your brand, your brand will look after you. Yes, brand is a small word, but at PKFFPM, we believe it is very important. And it's not just about your logo or your stationery, but rather your brand must be embedded in your people, your service or 
and product and everything you do. Because your brand is what people say about you, it's about your reputation, it's about your perception. Hopefully we deliver, and we certainly try to, because we're conscious we need one promised experience, consistently expressed and pragmatically applied. We at PKF FPM Accountants believe that the PKF FPM brand is associated with a desire to serve and care, to deliver service excellence. PKF FPM believe that our motivation in life and indeed business as trusted business advisors should be to help others to win and achieve their dreams and quality of life aspirations. From the outset, we sought to attract, develop and reward the very best talent to ensure our business and our clients' future success. Our value proposition is to utilize our international links to our membership of the PKF International Network, one of the leading accountancy and business networks in the world, to ensure global expertise with local knowledge. Our desire is to make a difference, push boundaries to deliver results and positive change through design, creativity and innovation in terms of impact solutions for both existing and potential clients. We were delighted and indeed honoured to host this leadership talk this morning in association with our fellow Management Leadership Network champion organisation, the Ulster Business School at Ulster University, as part of the MNN Management Month. The Ulster Business School here at Ulster University, celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, has established itself as the province's premier business school and continues to gain prestige, international recognition and credibility under the leadership of its charismatic dean and astute leader, Professor Mary McHugh. It was my great privilege to work closely with Professor McHugh in the organisation of today's event. And I would like to publicly thank her for all her guidance and support and through her, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University Professor Alistair Adair, and indeed I believe congratulations may be in order, and Alistair is about to take up the role of interim, short term, whatever it's called, uh, interim uh, Chancellor of the University, and indeed all their colleagues. Congratulations also to the Management Leadership Network and our fellow champion organisations, many represented with us here today, under the direction of Bill Manson, assisted by Podium, who have put together I think you can see it in all the billboards around Belfast this, this morning. I had my eyes open but as I was driving around early at uh, the events for this February's uh, Management Month initiative. You will appreciate that events like this morning just don't happen. In respect of the food and hospitality, <coughs> we thank Lucia Campbell and her student team at the University Academy Restaurant. In terms of university administration, we thank Mary Doyle and Nick Reed and the facilities management team. In terms of ICT and audio, we thank Chris Ian and their team. We'd also like to acknowledge the support of C.O. down there, Jane Wells from JPRNI. We'd like to thank Simon Mooney and Mooney Media for all their assistance, and I noticed Jim coming from this to me before the event today, in terms of design, printing and artwork for today's event. And also to our own video team led by Darren McCoy, and not forgetting our photographer, uh, Stephen Howell. Thanks also, so I hope you're all looking very, very well, because perhaps we should have told you in advance, but thanks also to Destination Yuri for streaming the leadership talk on live TV. You can see there's a TV here looking down at you all the time on the camera as well. Yeah. And I confirm that the leadership talk this morning uh, uh, was streamed and is being streamed live uh, throughout the world via Destination Yuri. And I can also confirm, if you want to look at it tonight or tomorrow or the next day, you'll be able to view it, believe it or not, on PKF FPM TV channel. <laughs> <laughs> At Vario, you have to reinvent yourself, you know. At, at, um, at Vario.ie forward slash PKF FPM, are we accessing it from our website? I think you'll all agree we we're very fortunate to be entertained by beautiful music at the registration reception down below by the Arco String Quartet, and we thank them again for their beautiful music. As Mary referred to early, earlier, the past few months have been very exciting for PKF FPM with the joining of Laurie Grant and his colleagues from J.L. Grant & Co, the opening of our new uh, refurbished prime location in Belfast office, and the appointment earlier this week of Monica McLaren as a new equity director with PKF FPM. As many of you know, Monica is the current chairman of the Institute of Tax in Northern Ireland, and 
joins my distinguished colleague, Mr. Hardy. He's the chairman of the Charter Departments Tax Committee. So if you, if you add into that, Burns, and all our other members of the tax team, if, you, if, you, if you're on the way of a tax, we can help you all the time. Then. <laughs> Indeed, I am conscious as I get up each morning how fortunate and honored I am to lead a positive team, PKFFPM. And once again, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for their tremendous support in the organization of the PKM Leadership Talk. In terms of thanks, finally, I would like to thank you for coming along in such great numbers and ensuring a full house within days of the invitation being issued. Now just before I conclude, I have one further uh, pleasant thing to do. What do you buy? <laughs> the managing, the chief executive, the president of Moat, Champagne, and everything else, and all the luxury goods are going. But we just go for, we try to get perhaps one of the top artists in Ireland to do a wee favour first. And so I have to share it with you, or I thought I was going to share it with you, but I want to have it. I have to explain this to you, this is rather unique. This actually is called. Uh, Pen Parfait. It's by an artist called Brenton Pierce, who's one of Ireland's finest. And you see what he's trying to do here is he's trying to depict Jim's life. And he has first of all here uh, Restraver. Anybody recognize him as Restraver? And then he has Jim at the pub and he's holding <laughs> the New York Times. And I better put my glasses on so you don't mind to read what it says. Old age, Jim. Believe it or not, it says, holding the New York Times, it says Restraver Man needs more Hennessy to record sales. And the other side it says, Clerken promotes peace and reconciliation to a corporation Ireland. On the right hand side, hanging on the wall, is a quote from Jim's late father. Remember, you're not that good. <laughs> <laughs>